Thomas Knauer Design Studio is sponsored by Old City Quilts. Discover quilting paradise between New York and D.C. Hello and welcome to Design Studio with Thomas Knauer. I'm Thomas Knauer and for today's episode we're going to be talking about stripes. Stripes are really one of my favorite design elements, not so much just because stripes are stripes, but because for me they're they're about a timeline. They're about moving through the stripes, working through a sort of narrative progression. And I think of stripes really as telling a story, a very abstract one, admittedly, but it's about the pacing of a story. In fact, this quilt here um, is based on taking a walk with my children to go down to the local coffee shop. So the size of the stripes is really about telling that story. So anyone with kids, you start off, you're moving fine, you're going along, and then there's the inevitable distraction. Maybe Simon finds a rock that he wants to throw into a hole, or Matilda sees a great stick, or anything, but there's that pause. And then we catch back up and then continue on our way. So the stripes really, for me, are then a basic way of sort of telling that small story, but then the story really gives me a way to think about what size the stripes should be. And then color can come in to sort of give the flavor of that narrative. If they were all very similar in color, it's a very smooth transition. Radical color changes speak to, well, a very choppy trip or disruptions to the trip. Or even like with this one at the very end, we see a complete change of direction. That might be a arrival at a destination and a new timeline. So stripes can really speak to a lot of stories that we might want to think about. Stripes also have a great capacity for me to sort of represent our world. We have stripes everywhere. Um, wherever we look, we see fences, we see the stripes on a road, or in this quilt over here, um, that is the UPC code um, and the, the barcode for a mass-produced Martha Stewart quilt that I then turned into a handmade quilt to then speak to, well, the value of handmaking or of personally making. But still at its core in terms of the design, it's still just stripes. And so stripes can do so many things once we sort of move them past being purely a formal element. So today I want to play a bit with looking at how different stripe relationships, how different stripe structures can get us to different results. Uh, the first thing I want to look at is oops, using very low, low value, low color change, keeping a really tight palette Let's go with this color instead. We can see even using, and here's something I really love doing with stripes, is actually cutting, instead of using one solid piece of cloth for this area where I have the same color stripe, the seams themselves can get you a little stripe that's almost a phantom stripe. It's not an actual color break, but there's a disruption in the flow, a separating. So just this low, low value gets you a much more subtle relationship. It's almost speaking to some of the issues of the sublime or the ethereal that a lot of early minimalists spoke about or used you know, one color paintings to really speak about texture and depth and subtlety. We start moving into greater color contrast and we start having greater disruption, more movement. We're still just playing with how color really now we can see is chopping this space up. And it really is segmenting the space as a metaphor for segmenting time. But here we see now playing with what does it mean to have sort of a common color that runs throughout. So we're starting here, changing return, change return, change return is a very different sort of conceptual relationship than if we just start running lots of different colors. 
now sort of each stripe is its own sort of visual space, its own reality, and starts to break things up entirely. Um, what I really like to play with then, when we really get into it, is start using those width changes. Those big spaces versus tight spaces bring out that much stronger narrative component to me. I'm going quickly, but the slow, and what slow really does is we're using a bit of sort of gestalt theory in terms of design and design theory in that we have two sight organs that really work together. It's the eyes and the brain, and in the combination, we're sending signals back and forth. The brain is recognizing large pauses. There's a gap, there's a difference, so then the eyes are sort of retold to go back and linger there. And so what you're doing with these syncopating or shifting of spaces is really buying different amounts of time for the eyes at different spaces, which then really does subtly, um, subconsciously, start to get you, the, the, the viewer is seeing that narrative pacing that you're talking about. We can also then, what becomes really, to me, is start breaking up the directions. And now you're starting to play with balancing the quilt, balancing different components to get multiple timelines laying on top of each other and speaking in different directions. This is where we get into fragmenting the quilt up, producing lots of different spaces, and I'm just going to play a bit. And note on playing here, I love working with paper to do my layouts. Instead of drawing them, because every time if you're doing your design on hand, you are drawing it. If you make a change, you've got to erase it or start over. Just cutting up some craft paper lets you do exactly what I'm doing here, just playing around, making different decisions, and seeing how those work out. And we'll see here a couple of my most beloved effects are having, when I change directions, having an element. So this stripe and then this horizontal stripe, they're the same color, and we'll start producing alternate shapes and alternate directions that really then guide the viewer's eye through the space in a specific way. And ultimately, that's kind of what we're wanting to do, I think, or what I'm wanting to do with all of my quilts is give paths and directions and hopefully multiple paths for the viewer and ultimately the quilt user to sort of move through the space and find their own relationship to it. And ultimately, that's what design is about is it's not just about an abstract notion of aesthetic beauty for me. It is a using, these, using visual elements to communicate something. So when working with stripes, I would encourage everyone to sort of find an underlying reason, a basic, simple structure in which that, that informs you about future decisions. So you're not left at that awful spot of you've gotten halfway through and you really don't know what decision to make because you haven't been working from a set of directions. And I love directions in quilts. Um, working from a system that allows infinite room for play within the system versus working from a pattern. So I might look at designing a quilt that is about lots of different timelines and spaces and just say, I'm going to have five areas, one of which will be big. And then I can just play off of that. But that basic structure is the pattern, albeit a very loose one. Of course, all of this gets even more complicated when we start bringing in quilting. And that's what we'll be doing in the next segment. Uh, I hope to see you.
So we've been working with stripes so far, looking at changes in widths and direction and multiple direction changes and how all of that can really build a narrative within the quilt. I want to look at one thing more today is then using angled stripes um, and how angled stripes can also offer a more chaotic sense of time or sense of the narrative and progression. We don't always move in a perfect linear path. We have absolute fragmentation of our lives at times. And there's a nice easy trick for those of you that might be relatively new for getting those angled stripes. Some people may, you know, fret about using things other than straight right, le or straight right angles. So what I do is just take my two colors that I'm going to piece together, lay them one on top of the other, pick an angle, get my rotary cutter, remembering always to have the guard on when you're not using it, and make my cut. And make sure it cuts all the way through. And now I have these two pieces, which are, well, completely not right, but what you do is you flip one of them, and since they're based on the same angle, they're going to relate back to each other. And now we have our perfectly set up for my easy peasy quarter inch seam. Fold it over like this, and then once you've sewn, you fold it back, and you have your odd angle. Then you would continue along. With each new one, you can just lay over a next one, cut, flip the new piece, and you can keep going. It makes working with odd angles in your stripes, or really any other shape, unbelievably easy. Now, I also want to talk about quilting. I, well, I've I one fallen in love with quilting, but is when I'm working with these variable width stripes, I will tend to work with then variable distances between my straight lines of quilting. Instead of imposing a regularity, I build in then this new variable texture. So you're building sub-rhythms within each stripe. And what I will often do, I long-armed this, and I love using the long arm for straight line quilting because it just makes it so much easier, is then I will do my dominant color on the long arm, but then I'll come back to my handy dandy domestic and bring in different thread colors, often bring in different thread weights. I might quilt the dominant in say a 50 weight thread, but then drop to a something in the 20s or 30 weight, so I get a thicker, maybe a longer stitch. And what makes that extra fun and easy is since I have all of that dominant quilting in place, now I have all of these great guidelines to just follow, and I can just use the edge of my walking foot to go ahead and handle the quilting. I'll find the foot pedal and go. And I'm just going to stop there so we can see what we've gotten. I went a little skewed at the end, of course, because I just did. But we can see working in a longer stitch in an off color produces now, and I love stitch length changes, because now it actually really contrasts sort of a second direction. This is the stripes moving this way, but I see the different, what we would call time stoppages. The stitch lengths, another time division going along the stripe, and those thread length, those stitch length changes produce another sub-rhythm to go along with the color changes, working in an orange, working in this bit of blue, or we can see a full line of blue right over here, and how that the color changes really get me three stripes at a large scale within that, each of which are broken down even further. So quilting with stripes can really do a lot of the work for you to get you a lot more movement, a lot more play, and a lot more interest in that, even if the quilt as a whole, when you've just pieced the top, is relatively simple what that's opening up for is room to play with the quilting to add those textures in 
And another component I really love doing is I'm going to use a 12 weight sort of embroidery thread and flip my quilt around and do a little bit of sashiko where I can just, you just poke through and you load up a bunch of stitches one after another. And then pull that needle through. And then we get this really heavy and rhythm stop, sort of the, uh, the yellow dotted dividing line on the street between those elements. And we can start to develop a whole lot of different weights and layers and relationships and textures that produce a whole lot more movement within it. And another bit, and we can start to see how that heavyweight thread and the different type of stitching really brings in another texture. Now, thinking even further about the quilting, we're going to look at another striped quilt. And even another idea with striped quilting is even offsetting your stripes and how those different stripe rhythms play relative to each other. But this, instead of using straight line, I worked with the curvilinear shape, which then in each of these groups, in the shape of the quilting, the eye blends together the two different bits of the stripes, and we get all of these different color shape relationships within the quilting. So quilting with the stripes, what one needs to think about is, do I want the quilting to follow the basic idea of the piecing, or would I rather have it do something entirely different, uh, produce an entirely alternate rhythm to the basic flow of the quilt? And what we haven't done here is look at the idea with our, back to our basic stripes, is what about changing the direction entirely? going horizontal to the quilt would actually start producing these small sub-rectangles, subdividing that stripe that way. If you syncopate those distances, you're going to get all these different sub-rectangles within your stripes, producing an entirely different notion of the rhythm. So there are a whole lot of options we have here to play with, and then one more to add into that is what I like to do with a lot of my straight line quilting is with this quilt behind me. What I do is load the quilt a little bit loose or for you domestic, quilt, domestic machine quilters, um, you can actually just do that more easily. Don't worry about being perfectly straight. But what I quilt on are perfect straight lines but if you look carefully at the quilt, you can see I cross over some of the seams. Some, I start off above the seam, and then it falls below, and I might be massaging the quilt up or down a little bit. There are times I've even loaded the quilt a little bit skewed, so I get those slightly off rhythm to the quilt lines. But what that does is start to get a little bit of movement, those rectangles that are the stripes cease to be so geometrically perfect. They get a little bit of curve to them, a little bit of movement to them, and it feels a lot less formal. It relaxes the geometry of the stripes, which sort of speaks to that mushiness a little bit of time. Things flow with each other versus perfectly divide. And it also then lets you get a bit of feel. You can see at times in this quilt behind me, there are pieces that might actually then be pulled onto slight curves. It almost takes on a little bit of a G's bend feel. But using your quilting not to purely follow the geometry of the design, but to let it reshape that geometry a little bit. So there are a lot of options we can play with when it comes to the quilting to further complicate the relationships of the stripes. So even though the top may start off as very simplistic, it can really evolve and grow through a lot of different techniques or approaches or at times even complete accidents 
to build in the subtleties of the narrative, the texture not just of the quilt, but the texture of the story that you're trying to speak about with your stripes. And join me next time and we'll do some more quilting. So since we've been talking a lot about quilting and different quilting ideas, I wanted to bring out the handy quilter a little bit. And this is especially for perhaps quilters that don't have a long arm, um, but are interested in what it can do, especially for straight line quilting, but might have a shop or a long arm dealer nearby that rents time on the machine. And there's a great feature with most long arms that allows you to do, use something that's called the channel lock. And what the channel lock does is it allows, forces the machine to only move in one direction. It locks it so it's no longer able to move in every direction. It is simply a back and forth or our straight lines. And so what that means is, if you, especially if you don't have your own long arm, you can use your channel lock to get these perfect straight lines, and it's especially useful if you want to play with those syncopated straight line quiltings because you can just move it however far along you want between the lines without worrying about perfect distance between the lines. So I'm going to go ahead and bring the machine over into place and do a quick thread pull up. And then I am going to use my channel lock to set it to only move horizontally. So now when I start stitching, it'll simply move perfectly and I don't have to really work very hard at it. I release my channel lock, stitch down a little bit, reset the channel lock, come back, Release, move just a little, reset. And I can just go back and forth, back and forth with these fabulous little straight lines, which makes it so much easier than doing it on a domestic. And I'll move you off to the side. And so we can see these lovely straight lines. I've gotten a little bit of puckering there. I would want to reset my tension, but we just get easy, simple straight lines. And now, so we have our quilt pieced, or designed and pieced and quilted, and we're going to then look a little bit at binding because I really want to go soup to nuts with really looking at the quilt design process. And I think something that a lot of people sort of misunderstand when it comes to designing a, a quilt is that the design process is more than just designing the piecing of the top and choosing the fabric. Each step in working on a quilt, as I hope we've seen today, adds a different layer so we can let different parts do different things to the design of the quilt. So with this quilt top or with this quilt, with these stripes and lots and lots of colors, things to consider would be if I quilt lay, say, this light blue binding strip on, do I want to pick up a color from the quilt top and pull it out where you see then all the other colors lines stop at the binding, whereas one stripe might flow all the way through? Or I could play that where I occasionally pick up a stripe and find a little bit of green and maybe just lay this down and pop in a second color that gets pulled out. So a little bit of fussy binding, uh, pulling just one color here. So I have here it pulls out, others it stops. I pull in another that can pull out and we can play with that again they, they'll feel like different length stripes relative to each other because how they relate to the binding. What if I wanted to only allow 
one color in one spot to ever have that extension feeling. So I might take this yellow and run it down here. So I have these color changes, but I'm going to make sure that I never again have a color overlap. So I might be doing some more fussy cutting, but I really, really emphasize that one exclusion versus I have that binding color continue around and it pops out. That one relationship stands out far more by doing that. Another thing I like to do is I might then bind it all in one color. I do have some overlaps going in, but then I inset just one small piece within that crossover between the binding and the top to then break up the flow of that as if it's a river split, splitting into two tributaries. And I can really play with then how does the quilt continue or get framed. And so we can see here these little design decisions really change how the edge feels. This feels has one vibe to it, whereas this produces a very different visual and formal relationship of the quilt. So we always have that last opportunity when it comes to binding to accentuate or minimize certain elements within the design to further be playing with what the quilt ends up looking like. And that's what I mean by the design process goes far beyond just doing the sketch. We can step again and again and again and build out a design through the process and would hopefully having a more structured approach to working out a design, building a system that allows for play within it not only does it allow you to improvise a little bit and respond to what's happening, but it hopefully gives you more room to simply play and have fun with the process of making your own quilts. So we've worked our way through a lot of issues in dealing with striped and quilts from design ideas through some piecing, binding, quilting, et cetera, et cetera. And I want to come back to this quilt again to look at really what stripes can be, not just what they can do. In this case, we have the stripes changing direction in each block, but that is because each of these blocks of stripes are using binary, zeros and ones, to form letters. So in this case, we have a zero, one, zero, one, all right, zero, one, zero, zero, one, zero, zero, one, and that is the letter I. So this quilt then spells out the phrase, smart is beautiful. And it was made for my daughter, Matilda, because so often girls are told to be smart and beautiful. And I wanted her to know that smart is beautiful. And quilters around the country and world sent blocks in for this because I wanted it to be about the community coming together. So we can see then those dots or the squares, they disrupt the stripes, but we still see that essential stripeness. And stripes can be very resilient to interruption. But here then the stripes are at the service of being something more than just a formal device. And then when we look at the quilting, these straight lines have two different distances apart that they can have, short or a long distance. And we have zeros and ones, zero, one, zero, 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 one, all continuous. And that is also binary, which then spells out in the quilting the same phrase, smart is beautiful. So here we then see bringing it all together to allow stripes to become something more. That form is not its own reward. It is at the service of speaking through our quilts. And so I want to thank you all for joining me, and I hope that through this episode we've, we've seen some new ideas or learned some new processes or even just a new way of thinking about the quilts you make for yourself and those around you. Thank you for joining me, and I'll see you next time on Design Studio with Thomas Knauer. Thomas Knauer Design Studio is sponsored by 
Old City Quilts. Discover quilting paradise between New York and D.C.